What's up, everybody? Today is one of my favorite episodes of the offseason. We're covering uh, 10 things to remember for 2023. Things you need to look back on. It's not like three things or five things or seven. We did 10 of them. We put in some work today. You're going to love them. Don't miss a minute. Leave a comment. Enjoy. Welcome to the Fantasy Footballers Podcast with your hosts, Andy Holloway, Jason Moore, and Mike Wright. Oh, welcome in. Andy, Mike, and Jason, the Fantasy Footballers. Thursday, March 2nd. Which reminds me that tomorrow's March 3rd, which reminds me that Mike has a birthday. Oh, I will, the moments are ticking away. Of your, your youth is just... You've reminded me of something, and I didn't have to bring it up, but I'll be a, I'll be, I'll be a man about it. Hmm. I was... I had full intentions of it's 40 time during the, the intro. And just totally and forgot. It. Totally oh. forgot. No, I, di I didn't hold it back. I just, I was looking something Rich. else up. I totally forgot about it, but I'm letting people know. You can go back and play it, and in your head just say, it's 40 <laughs> time. I mean, I, it makes Which, sense that you would be forgetting it. Yes, due to the you're... age. And it works out because people about to run 40s mm -hmm, on the weekend. I, yeah. I see. Combine, Combine time. time. Yeah. Well, uh, almost happy birthday, Mike. And yeah. people be drinking 40s, so <laughs> it works in so many different ways. So that's it's going on. It's 5 o'clock somewhere. And uh, I would be... It's 40 time. <laughs> I'd be neglecting... Can we go to the wide camera here? I'd be neglecting my duty as a host if I didn't point out Jason's giant cup. <laughs> oh. We're doing it. Yes. Yes. <laughs> I'm just trying to hydrate, my man. Drink a lot of water. Well, Mike brought it up when we were recording the Spitballers podcast, and it was entertaining, so I felt like... Okay. Kind of I mean, matches my shirt. It's well, a huge cup. He's got a cup that has... Uh, what is that? Like a gallon? <laughs> it's it's a quarter gallon cup, um, and I poured a, a normal can, uh -huh. like soda can size in here. And it's it's pretty much empty. The it, cup is empty. It reminds me of the you guys remember the the BK commercial where he like he couldn't hold the burgers because he had the tiny hands. And oh, and so it's like Jason now. The cup makes your hands look like real so small. Jason's working. Look at on, those look at those tiny hands. <laughs> He's, He's working on the <laughs> very good audio that we're putting out there on that, the podcast. It's just a tease to go to YouTube.com. Brooks, do you like all the cup talk that's uh, we've been having on the podcast? We need more of it. More cup talk. <laughs> yeah. Um, and are we? Uh, we're not announcing the winner of the UBK award yet, not or the today. listener league spot. Not today. Next episode. Next episode. Okay. So thanks to everybody that jumped in ultimatedraftkit.com with the chance to win the listener league spot. You can still jump in if you want yeah. access to the Dynasty Pass right now with the UDK Plus. And we said the combine is happening this weekend. That means that a another round of updates will be coming in very soon. Yeah, very excited about that. Let's uh let's jump into the news. News and notes from around the league. Well, the defense is doing work Thursday, Friday at the Combine, the NFL Combine happening this weekend. Quarterbacks, wide receivers, tight ends for on Saturday, running backs, offensive linemen on Sunday. So, yeah, it's 40 time. What do you guys look for uh, from Combine Weekend as it pertains to fantasy? As it pertains to fantasy, there's a few things. I, I'm probably the most important thing. It's not as fun, but as as it pertains to fantasy, is weight. I sure. I care a lot about the weight of certain wide receivers. We're uh, we're going to talk about that a little bit today. I care a lot about the weight of running backs. We we can discuss that as well. I mean, if if you go back through the top twenty fantasy football finishers at the running back position, they're all. 200 pounds or heavier uh, last year. I believe Austin Eckler was the only one at 200. Most all of them are 215, 220. So uh, the weight matters. I mean, these body types, there's there's a reason that they work in the NFL. And the nice thing is as the NFL is changing and adapting and, you know, evolving, we 
we change our numbers. Yeah, and it's a big uh, it's a big show today. We got the ten things to remember episode, so we're going to be breaking down some insights, some things we want you to hold on to heading into the upcoming fantasy football season. A lot has changed over the years, and and there are things that we need to keep in mind. So, uh, a couple bits of news before we get into those uh, ten things to remember: the Bucks planning to cut Lenny oh, Leonard Fournette, the dump, the dump truck. truck himself. He's gonna get dumped. Yeah. It's getting dumped like a truck. Their GM was kind enough to come out and say he's still got a lot in the tank. He's only 28. He'll do great elsewhere. I mean, that is the most fantasy football thing for a GM to say because when I'm trying to trade a player away, we're all all the fantasy players are great at saying, listen, this player's great. This yeah. player's amazing. Lot They're awesome. Yeah, so good on your team. Yeah, I know. I like he's, he's got a lot left. He's only 28. Sir, we know we know, we know the, the cliff. We we know the age that running backs start to tail off. They also are cutting their left tackle. Yeah, Donovan Smith is. I mean, they gonna, they've been up against it uh, against the cap. So these two moves are they are not players who are bad outright. Leonard Fournette still has some to give. Donovan Smith had a down year, but he'll get a good job. It's just these were expensive players they couldn't afford. <laughs> Huh? <laughs> Kenny Galladay will be released by the Giants on the first day of the league year, March 15th. The million dollar catch man. Do you think he said, finally? <laughs> <laughs> like, what took him so long? How much money did they pay him almost, in total? Almost a million dollars per catch. <laughs> wow. I don't have the the exact numbers in front of me. I'll go look up his stats and I can tell you how much money he made. <laughs> wow. Yeah, I it didn't work. So let's see. So Kenny Galladay as a giant had uh let's see, forty three receptions, and I think he made just under forty he was like, like forty two points something. Yeah, he had a forty million dollar guaranteed contract, seventy two million four year contract is what he signed. That's unbelievable. And if you yeah. look at the uh That's a that's about a big of a whiff as you could possibly have. I think a uh, friend of the show, Warren Sharp, tweeted the fact that uh, he like the list of the ten players that Dave Gettleman had signed to long term deals. Hey, don't talk about me. And it's a it's Dave. just a disaster. It's like you gave somebody a quest, and the quest was to burn the money for a franchise, and he unlocked the achievement. I mean, it, it was an embarrassing list of players that had been, yeah, thank you, that had been cut, you know, quickly and money invested and released. And yeah, um, he was was he the one that? Oh yeah, the drafted Saquon number two. Oh yeah, yeah, Overall. he was he was the one who did that. I believe wasn't he also in uh, Carolina with the Christian McCaffrey? I'll have to look. Okay, it up. vet that one. Uh, but that's what you get for making fun of the analytics nerds, bro. You <laughs> suck at your job. <laughs> okay. I mean, Mike, that was mean spirited and so true, hey. and I loved it. And it's really that's well, what was necessary. I will. I will tease the fact that Mike will speak to the Dave Gettleman issue later on in the show. Oh, I am. Yeah, you are. Okay. You're, you're going to talk about something later that I think ties into the Dave Gettleman issue. Okay. But I'm going to leave it there. Okay. And then if you don't remember it by the time you're talking, I'll remind you that that's what it is. Excellent. I can't uh, wait. <laughs> the Falcons have released Marcus Mariota. Yep. That was, I mean, we, we okay. knew that was coming. And then um, the Bengals director of player personnel came out and made a couple of comments. Yes. Uh, comment one, since we've talked about it already, he talked about whether or not Joe Mixon would be on the roster. His response was, I don't know. Well, the the, the big thing is you have to tie the two comments together because okay. it was uh, Duke Tobin was asked about trading T. Higgins because that has spiraled out of control from, like I think, just a brief hint in in a uh, in someone's article, and then it just the, – the flames grew on Twitter, and then a lot of people were talking about it because they will have to make a, a very serious T. Higgins decision eventually, but not this year, and it was – are you going to trade T. Higgins? And the quote was, quote, trading T. Higgins is not on my mind. And also a quote of, it's a little ridiculous right now to talk about trading T. Trading T. Higgins. He also told Com teams to get their own wide receiver. Compare that to, is Joe Mixon going to be on the roster? Quote, I don't know. <laughs> hmm. Yeah, well, that's not ridiculous. That is not a ridiculous <laughs> yeah. question. 
That's, so you're like that's a fair one, and I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I think I think the math the mathematicians are the ones bringing the T Higgins question forward because they know they know that the Joe Burrow signing is going to happen, and they know that there's uh, the Joe Mixon question is one of money, right? It's it's not that yes. they wouldn't want Joe Mixon back for free. It's that how much do you want to spend on your your running back? Yeah, so, Hig Higgins is entering his contract year. Uh, we'll talk more about him. I mean, he's either going to get a deal or he's going to be a, a highly paid free agent. Those yep. are the two outcomes for T. Higgins. Any other news, Brooksy? Nothing. All right, we're moving on. Don't forget to remember these things. Speaking of gigantic hands. <laughs> Uh, Me and that clip. Yeah, there was a little uh, video clip. I, I I'm definitely it. palming a basketball with that hand. Yeah, no, you uh, you had tied the ribbon around your finger, which is one of the... With one hand, probably, because it's so enormous. When you were growing up, apparently that's the only way to remember stuff. Yeah, but you, you've you ever done that? I mean, yes, when I was a child. For uh, real? Yeah. I've never even heard of this. Oh, yeah, yeah. Like, I'll I'll still sometimes when there's... Will you do that? I'll not, I don't tie a ribbon on, but like I'll put maybe a rubber band on my finger. And so later on... When you're like, why? Oh yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. You, you you've just, forgotten some things over the years. You could have used a ribbon. I've forgotten to put the ribbon on my finger. I it's normally just, go with the sticky note in the most obvious, stupid place. I'll go sticky note on the wallet. Okay, on the wallet. Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll stick them to like lights in the house or <laughs> up high on like cabinets where my wife can't reach it if I'm reminding her of stuff. So it's just up there. So then you know a step stool has to be involved That's to get right. the note down. That's right. I, I do. <laughs> this it, note's important. I use my height to and put them in a place where it's just annoying. If the task is, if the note is gone and the task is not completed, you're like, mm-mm, you knew about it. That's right. That's right. That's some good work. All right, 10 things to remember, which is you know another way of saying some lessons we've learned over the last fantasy football season, things we've learned over the past few years. Some of these are trends that are changing. I want to remind people. I guess I'm reminding them to remember. Yes. Bwah. <laughs> Rookies get run. Yeah. Okay. The rookie running backs were another year into fantasy football, and they continue to deliver. Last year, Kenneth Walker, uh, Brees Hall, Tyler Algier, Damian Pierce, Isaiah Pacheco, Rashad White, James Cook, Brian Robinson Jr. Even who the, like the rookies we were kind of nervous about even rookies that have were shot with a gun contributed, sure, yeah, yeah. contributed yeah. last year which I mean, that's, uh, and they all had i think the big case for me here is that there were there were bona fide legitimate reasonable fair-minded reasons why they weren't going to deliver as rookies all of them mm -hmm. from rashad penny being ahead of kenneth walker to you know the the tandem in new york how long would it take Brees hall you know, Algier buried in the depth chart behind Cordero, and the list goes on. Obviously, Antonio Gibson and being shot yeah. for Brian Robinson, yet right. still had a season in which fantasy value was produced as a rookie running back. And you had, once again, um, you know, Brees Hall, he didn't get to play a full season, but he was the RB7 while he was playing. Damian Pierce finished in the top 24. Ken Walker in the top 24. This is an every-year occurrence. So it's important that we as fantasy players – Remember that. You go back to 2012, you've had at least two rookie running backs in the top 24 at the end of every year. It's going to happen again. The running back class is strong. Teams are, you know, they're making the Joe Mixon decision right now in Cincinnati. And you have, a, 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 we have a great article. I should have mentioned it at the top. A, a really, really good free agency article for Matthew Betts, Kyle Borgannoni, up on the website. 100 questions about free agency. 100 but the, you didn't say that wrong. 100 100. Questions. It's over a million uh, words, right? Uh, 10 million words? Yeah. I don't remember. You have the real number, Kyle? It's over 11,000, but we did it a service. It only takes 54 minutes to read. I was going to say that Stephen King read through it, and he's like, fellas. Fellas. This is long. <laughs> but one of the first ones, so you don't have to read 54 minutes to get to it, was just highlighting that the free agency class, there's some big names out there at running back, right? Yes. Uh, Saquon Barkley's out there. Uh, Tony Pollard's out there. You have uh, David Montgomery, a bunch of starters, I would say. And yet you know that these teams are making that mathematical decision. You can draft some of these running backs. They're going to be put in positions to succeed. Running backs aren't getting taken as high in drafts, which means they're going to better teams. And so 
let's remember this year that rookies get run once again. The path may not seem clear in August, but it will be happening. Rookies will be contributing at the running back position, especially as the season goes on. Uh, be willing to draft and hold. Be willing to take the leap. It's going to work out if you pick the right ones. And the, that question, which we can't answer right now, but it's just it's fun to speculate. That turns into, at what point in the first round do you draft B. John Robinson in a redraft? Because he will go if if he is a sele if he's selected in the first round of the NFL draft, Bijan will go in the first of your fantasy football redraft. I, I could tell you I've done several best ball drafts already this off season. Yeah, where's he going? He is number ten. He, he is. Sorry, I forgot that at the top of the drop. <laughs> I was uh, just throwing that in there. Also, he could go at number ten. He, he could, but he has been consistently the number three running back off the board. It goes like. It's insane. McCaff, so what, what is in it? Redraft, what's it going? Yeah, no, in, in best ball. In best ball, oh, in best start ball. up redraft. So, what it, what's, what's it going right now? McCaffrey, Jonathan Taylor, Bijan. You said that's oh, ridiculous? Baby. I mean, that's just. Uh, look, why, why I, is love, that ridiculous? I love Bijan. Oh, Bijon. because it's too high. Yeah. I, I just, thought you were saying it the opposite based on <laughs> oh, no. your love of Bijan. No, I mean, I'm like, love how him. is this guy not the number one off the I board? I absolutely love him, but that is very high. Well, yeah, because you are very likely exchanging some early season success, right? For those other two players. Maybe. It's a maybe. There, There's definitely the chance he gets drafted, and you know going in that it's just going to be him every single week. But I'm the the probability is that you might have a, a little bit of time where you're not getting week one type of McCaffrey numbers and stuff like that. He also has to go to a place that's going to throw to the running back mm -hmm. to the degree that McCaffrey uh, can produce. Yeah, no, agreed. It's hard to draft him number three not knowing his landing spot. If Tennessee decides to grab him and stash him behind Derrick oh. Henry, you're going to be really sad he's the number three I, drafted runner. I will back. say that with all of the, the potential downsides or, or risks, people will want to do it as high as possible. Yeah, I mean, because it's fun. Well, and you had, you had Saquon, his, you had Zeke, like these guys who are drafted in the first let, rounds. Let me say a sentence for you Bijan Robinson could be. The greatest running back in the history <laughs> of the National Football League. He could You're be not and wrong. That's why he'll be drafted <laughs> higher than maybe he deserves. Number nine. All right, number nine. This is more of a uh, philosophical thing because there is a mental to be. Yeah, there there, there is a an element of that when it comes to fantasy football, and it is don't be afraid of your own ideas because the NFL gets things wrong all the time and there it is <laughs> i'm back there's your david gettleman or don't talk about me i'm not even working anymore i was right in my own way but like kenny galladay just got cut after making nearly one million dollars a reception the denver broncos <laughs> sold their souls for russell wilson chase edmonds got the first free agent running back contract of last year's free agency period the patriots just a couple years ago dumped a ton of cash right into Hunter Henry and Jonu Smith. Look at that production. And Nelson Aguilar. And Nelson Aguilar. Allen Robinson, people. Allen, Allen people Robinson. make mistakes. <laughs> Allen Robinson, which I don't know if everybody followed this story of the, of the breadcrumbs, which was very interesting. Uh, I can't remember. I, I think maybe. Was um, it The Athletic? Norris. Maybe maybe Norris pointed oh, okay. it out. I can't okay. recall. Uh, but the, the, the story goes. The Eagles were the front runners for Allen Robinson. They had the cash ready for him. They thought he could still be that guy. And then it took a last minute call from Sean McVay, Cooper Cup, and company to and they swayed Allen Robinson. They gave him a huge amount of money. He's a Los Angeles Ram. We all know how that worked out, but it's like the looking at the situation of if Allen Robinson goes to Philadelphia, there's no way they trade their number one pick for AJ Brown. Give him that huge contract extension. Maybe they win the Super Bowl. Maybe they, they don't. But, I mean, A.J. Brown was a huge part of that. Anyways, so the Eagles were super glad that the Rams got that wrong. Zach Wilson over Justin Fields right now looks terrible. Jalen Rager drafted over Justin Jefferson. The list goes on and on and on. And I, I'm bringing this up simply not to uh, shield myself when I make my bad decisions because the NFL does it wrong all the time, but it's – that's that's just one of your inputs. The way that the NFL is telling us they believe about these players, it's just one thing. It's okay. 
it is okay to have a completely differing opinion from what the NFL is telling you about fantasy football players. And we all need to be open to these things. We need to be open that perhaps we are wrong. And we've I, I believe we've done a, a, a pretty good job at trying to adjust our opinions on this show. Like, we, we differ all the time. I was locked in. I thought the Broncos, I thought Russ still had it. I thought Hackett could get could put it together for the Denver Broncos. I thought they were going to be fantastic. The combination of that defense, get a really good offense in there. I thought that'd be great. Andy was very much on the other side. He, I think you took the under on their win total before the season even started. And I was like, ah, what a dummy. I was the dummy, and I <laughs> clearly got that one wrong. But the NFL gets things wrong. You will get things wrong, but don't let the NFL bully you into well, it, what your opinion should be about a player. Can I add an exclamation point? Absolutely. Also, don't let fantasy analysts bu bully you because exactly. we, we try not to be that way on the show. We share our opinions with, with reason and with loud voices, and we disagree and we agree. But what happens sometimes in the extended fantasy community is and the Twitter sphere in, in general is sure. that there is an – there's an attitude that you can't make a decision that differs from consensus or believes that, I don't know, Brees Hall is better than Najee Harris or something. You know, there, there are takes that you might have going into the year, and if you're convicted about them and you're willing to go down with that ship or rise in glory, don't be afraid to make that move, whether the NFL or an analyst is telling you that it's not highly probable because the improbable happens every year positively and negatively and and it's a good reminder that you know we're trying to equip you to build your own list we're trying to equip you to make your own decisions and um disagree with us feel yeah. free are you gonna hit that Anybody? number yeah i'm gonna hit that number <laughs> i'm gonna do that for you jason thank you number eight. Oh, the number <laughs> now eight you thing can <laughs> share your knowledge that i want to remember from this last season is that elite wide receivers changing teams be elite. Yep. We had a long history of free agent wide receivers changing teams. Or just wide receivers changing teams in general. And and pretty much sucking. And that, you know, we've we've seen it. We saw it obviously with Kenny Galladay getting the massive contract, going over and changing teams. But recent history, you know, you, you look back at what Stephon Diggs did when he changed teams and what he did for Josh Allen. But specifically this last year, you had three massive trades and I think it is different when it is a trade versus free agency when it is a trade a team is investing a whole lot into these players because usually it's draft capital plus a new contract and so this last year you had AJ Brown you had Tyree Kill you had Devontae Adams all shift teams as elite wide receivers and those teams are three of the top four teams in the biggest changes of wide receiver target share so when they went and acquired these players, they said, I'm doing this because I want to be a pass first team. I want to throw the ball to you. We value you. You've got a couple of run first teams right now that are in the market for a wide receiver. And this is not a great free agent wide receiver class. This is not an elite wide receiver rookie class where I think there's just a bunch of impact guys year one. So the trade market is going to be here for teams like the Chicago Bears the Baltimore Ravens, to go and get one of these guys. Bears already traded for their elite wide receiver. Oh, that's right. They they got, uh, they got uh, Chase. Yes, Chase they got Chase on the case. Um, you and, and you watched these elite wide receivers have unbelievable years. A.J. Brown, 101 receptions. His previous career high was 76. Tyreek Hill, highest targets per route run of his entire career. He led the NFL. Devontae Adams. Most contested, uh, contested catches and it's highest contetches, contetches it's cont most and highest, contetches. Uh, average depth of target of his career. So this coming season, there's a lot of names that have been rumored. You know, we talked about T. Higgins. Maybe he'll get traded. Yeah, it's too early to talk about. DeAndre Hopkins seems almost inevitable that he gets traded. Uh, you could see a situation where a team with cap troubles like the Buccaneers get Mike something Evans. for Mike Evans. There will be a couple of big name wide receivers traded and if they're elite I'm going to be in on them this coming year because we've seen these NFL teams say I'm committed to you with this transaction we already know you're elite and uh, so I'm, I'm well, going to be doubling down on that I think part of that is, is is the financial commitment it takes for an elite wide receiver in a contract it's massive like the, the that's one of the biggest commitments you can make we're not talking about the running back one year two year deals 
we're talking about like a team almost having to build around you and you know the value of of the pass first team I was going to say I'll, I'll fill it in Jason took some action on on this specific tip he was in a best ball draft yesterday the day before and it was is he ever not though yeah that's that part is true but okay. this is just it he's he's in there man he's putting the cash on the line and I think it was round three and he, he's Mike who would you draft in a best ball DeAndre Hopkins or Chris Olave. It's like man, that's that's a very interesting and he situation. Went Hopkins? And I after working through everything like we love Chris Olave, think second year wide receiver, these are players that you want to target. You have no idea what team DeAndre Hopkins is going to be on, but it was no when Hopkins was playing last year, he was still elite. If he gets traded, somebody wants him and they're going to feed him a bunch of targets and I, I narrowly moved it over, and I was like, I, I think I'd go Hopkins there. And he said, that's where I lean, and then click the button. You clicked the button. I did. <laughs> wow. Uh, um, I hopped on it. It's a, good, it's a good reminder. Let's take a quick break. We'll come back with some more. One thing we would never do on this show is provide uh, – Various amounts of insight without letting you know what number we're on. Number seven. And now we're here. We're very organized. Now we're here. All right, I'm going to call this winners win. That's okay? what they do. Winners win. I, I'm very excited about this one because it was an insight I had no idea about until I glanced and investigated and said, wow, that is kind of different than I expected. Um, we're talking about wide receivers. In years past, I've brought up the fact that I target running backs on winning teams. That's a It was something I split the difference between two players. I'm going to pick the team that I think projects to make the playoffs to be successful. But I wanted to look at the wide receiver production this year. And when I did, I noticed that there were just five of the top 20 fantasy wide receivers that were on teams with losing records. So that's, you know, that's a huge number, 75% yeah. on winning teams. Two of those five on a losing record team – actually made the playoffs, Chris Godwin and Mike Evans. So you really have a direct correlation to these victorious teams and, and wide receivers that are in the top 20. Then we looked back at 2021's data, and there you go. Over the last two years, 75% of all top 20 wide receivers have come from teams with winning records. So when you are sitting there, I, I wanted to look back at last year's ADP and think about some decisions you might have been making between a couple of players that if you had had the philosophy of, of remembering that you know, winning teams that you project to have success might be the difference maker on the pick, maybe you draft them differently. One of them was like the Mike Williams, Deontay Johnson decision, back-to-back -back in fantasy drafts. Well, Steelers, there wasn't a lot of confidence on that roster, rookie quarterback. Sure. Winning team in Los Angeles, even if it wasn't as good of a season as people expected in uh, with the Chargers. Another one that, this one would have been a little more difficult, but it turned out this way. A.J. Brown and Michael Pittman were back-to-back -back in the drafts. Colts had a disastrous year. A.J. Brown and the Eagles went to the Super Bowl. And then another one, back-to-back. -back. At this point, it seems ludicrous. But Amon Ross, St. Brown, and Brandon Cooks. Like, Houston being the bottom-dwelling team that didn't project to have a bunch of wins, maybe you didn't think that way about Detroit. It would have depended. You knew that they had some potential coming into this mm -hmm. year. That decision was, those players were interchangeable for a lot of people in drafts. So as you're going into 2023, as you're looking at wide receivers, just recognize the fact that 75% of the top wide receivers for two consecutive years have been on teams projected to make the playoffs. And maybe you take some Vegas data and you look at the win totals. Maybe that's a, a guide for you on making that decision between them. But I thought it was very interesting to discover that correlation the past couple of years. I love it. Okay, Jason loves it. Well, number six. I, I can't speak until the announcer says my number. Yeah. Number six. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, my name is Mike Wright, and for a lot of my life I have been a sizist. Okay. When it comes to fantasy wide receivers, I apologize because that is incorrect. Uh, we look. Well, you're a man with a, a big head, so you like a big – Yes. Big yeah. wide receiver? Yeah, no, I, especially wide receivers with a noggin that can compare to the size of mine, right. which is very, very few. <laughs> but the NFL is changing. Yes, back in the day, 
back when when we were kids, big wide receivers. That's where everything was. It was a different NFL game, though. You needed to have your gigantic wide receivers on the outside. They go up. They make the contested catch. But things are shifting. Tell me more. In the NFL draft, the average first-round wide receiver in the NFL from the years 2000 to 2013, the average height was 6'2 and a half and weighed about 216 pounds. Since 2014 through current, that has dropped all the way. The average has dropped down to 6'1", 202. Average for day two wide receivers in the NFL, the first time period from 2000 to 2013, 6'2", 211. NFL still wanted big players. And now in modern day, 2014 to 2022, 6'1", 204. For an average to drop a full inch in size and and seven pounds and for the first round 14 pounds that lets you know the nfl is changing things last year the top 10 wide receivers top 10 only three of them were over 200 pounds listed over 200 pounds you had Devonte adams aj brown and amari cooper the rest of the guys they're smaller because again the way that the nfl is working the way that the passing game is working the way that that the guys are moving around the position, the way that the slot wide receiver is utilized now. Slot wide receiver used to be a pretty dirty word in the NFL. Now you're like, now you can have offenses that run. It happens. Like sometimes Amon Ra types take over, and they're the number one wide receiver for your team. So I want people to remember. Like even we went into uh, our dynasty pass, where in the production profile area, where you take a look at the way that. Uh, Guys are playing if in the NFL currently and they're producing. Go back and look at their their size in college, what, what they listed at. That average, we took a look and we refreshed it. We dropped it down. It We dropped it down uh, about an inch and 10 pounds. And because these guys are actually coming through, no longer is it looking at the incoming uh, draft class and you're like, Quentin Johnston, he's he is it. He's the size speed freak. He's got to be the guy. You're like, well, Jackson Smith and Jigba is over there, much smaller than, than Quentin and, and Jordan Addison. Tiny guy. He's coming in because it's like, look look at like wonder, Devontae Adams. Thin. It didn't matter. The BMI, all that entire offseason. Talk about the BMI of Devontae Smith. Devontae that, Smith. Yeah. Did, oh, go. did I say it wrong? You said Adams. Oh, oh, sorry. Devontae Smith. <clears throat> Talking about the how how thick or slim Devontae Smith is, that talk is gone. That dude's elite. Yeah. I mean, I, I wonder, too, if this is a product. And, Kyle, I don't know if you have any thoughts on this. You might watch more college football than we do, but – I wonder how much of that has come out of college systems like where there used to be, I feel like there used to be, okay, here's a pro-style system, here's not a pro-style system. I feel like everything is not a pro-style system or formerly NFL pro-style system anymore. College is certainly influencing the way that the NFL so plays. Then, so then smaller players are probably getting more opportunities to function in these kind of high-flying collegiate systems. I think you're seeing smaller receivers excel at the next level and they say, hey, I'm not discounted because I'm 5'9 or 5'10. Like they can make it in the NFL. Yeah, Devontae Smith is going to get opportunities for a bunch of small guys for the next 10 years because of his success. Yeah, his success is part of why I am fine being kind of all in on Jordan Addison because he's, Jordan he's Addison thin. would usually be someone that I'd be like, man, I'd like him, but he's not he's not he's not the size that I usually go for. Chris Olave, I love this tape. Not usually the size o over, you know, the last decade that I've gone for. You're right, Mike. It's changing in the NFL. We need to adapt. We need to change. It's still – there's still a limit. You're not having itty-bitty baby guys come in here at 160 <laughs> pounds and dominate, but it has – Don't draft Tavon Austin in the first round. Exactly, but it has dropped a little bit, and we're okay now with some of these sub-200-pound wide receivers. And I would say especially ones that have proven themselves mm -hmm. to the degree that some of these players have, like Devontae Smith, who won the Heisman. Number five. I call this one remember – the remembrances. Ah, uh, as you would. Eloquent <laughs> and perfect. Look, this is a doubling down of two tips that I had on last year's things to remember. Those oh, tips. Oh, we're going to reflect? We're going to reflect on, on the remembrances. On the remembrances mm. because they were home runs. Not, not saying that to toot my own horn. I'm saying it because I didn't follow my own advice enough this year. It's hard not to. It, <laughs> it was one of those things where it was like, I I would bring this up on the show. And oh yeah, say, after this episode, you'd be like, oh yeah, remember this? Yes, remember this? And and but I I I didn't I didn't trust it enough. So the two things that I want to just remember quickly 
in summation. One was hurt don't help, which is guys that are hurt at the beginning of the season who have entered training camp injured, haven't gotten around. They, you know, you're you're at your draft and you think there's an injury dip. Oh, they'll be ready by week one or they're going to be here soon. Don't buy into it. It doesn't work. There are a few examples where it works, but the data, this was last year's data that was really good that made me say, hey, I got to remember this. Here's the data this year. I'm just going to read you a list of players. This is the players we tracked who were hurt early on in the season and draft season. James Robinson, Cam Akers, Daryl Henderson, J.K. Dobbins, Gus Edwards, Elijah Mitchell, Miles Sanders, Kenneth Walker, uh, Brian Robinson, Najee Harris, Mike Evans, Russell Gage, Chris Godwin, Michael Gallup. Jamison Williams, Sterling Shepard, Van Jefferson, Christian Watson, Kadarius Stoney, Michael Thomas, KJ Hamler, Darren Waller, Robert Tunyon, Irv Smith Jr., and Logos Thomas. There's, there's a ton of guys, That's a big right? list. Here's the guys that outperform their ADP. Miles Sanders, Kenneth Walker, Chris Godwin, Christian Watson. And honestly, Christian Watson was a bad pick because he didn't do it until the very end of the season because right. he was injured. I'm taking my... You All know, those other names you mentioned, just to put, make it clear underperform their ADP. Exactly. They all basically were not a, a not a great draft pick and the you know everything we do in fantasy football is just a, a a bet where we're trying to win most of the time. And this is a really high odds bet where you're saying if the guy is already injured, maybe look to a guy that's healthy. He maybe he'll it perform can, it better. It can be tempting. And what's wild about it is that their ADPs for many of these players were already reduced exactly there's there's a reason that jk dobbins was all the way down at running back 22 it's because you were getting a great deal because he was injured he, well, he finished as the running back 48 so it wasn't as as good a deal so you're right and then the other one was quarter blacks <laughs> quarter the, all these middling quarterbacks that change teams it happens every single year that you think and the narratives are going to be like oh they're going to must fix, be better they're going to fix the situation i mean it's hard to even imagine and remember, but Carson Wentz was a hero. He's got Terry McLaurin's finally got a quarterback. It's Carson Wentz. Hero to some. <laughs> yeah. Matt Ryan didn't fix Enemy anything. Enemy to all. <laughs> Baker Mayfield didn't fix anything. Carson Wentz didn't fix anything. Marks Mariota didn't fix anything. Even Russell Wilson didn't fix anything. Made it worse. Well, yeah, he broke some things. <laughs> so in 2022, when Derek Carr goes somewhere. I was going to say that's the brutal one. Well, oh, Carr no. Carr and Garoppolo He's, are are both players that you're going to have to decide if they're in the Matt Ryan, Baker Mayfield, Carson Wentz, Marcus Mariota tier. To me, they 100% are. It's not that they are bad quarterbacks. It's that, that they are not going to heal a franchise and take a player who's been mediocre and turn them into a superstar. It that, ain't happening. That's the sentence right there. Derek Carr isn't going to make them into superstars. Jimmy Garoppolo isn't. Daniel Jones, Wait, if he goes, isn't. Wait, what about Garrett Wilson? Uh, well, so... I, I, my notes here. My notes here say even Aaron Rodgers isn't going to fix anything. Oh boy! Asterisk unless he's replacing <laughs> Zach Wilson. Okay. okay. If if the bar, if the barometer is Zach Wilson, yeah, yeah you can fix some stuff. O other than that, quarter blocks don't fix anything. <laughs> okay. Moving on. Number four. All right. I'll call this one ending and trending. Oh. Because uh, it, look, here's a good thing to remember. The end of season rankings for players do not tell the whole story on the season. You need to keep a list of players who maybe ended the season with momentum in either direction, and it really tells a different story than their end of season rankings. And I have some numbers and some names on both sides of the equation. Here were some players that ended much more positive than their end of season ranking. Najee Harris. Ended as the RB14, was the RB4 over the last eight weeks. I'm just looking for first half, back half. Cam Akers, RB33 on the year, the RB7 over the back half. Keenan Allen, the wide receiver 41, the wide receiver 4 over the last eight games likely to stay in Los Angeles. Chris Godwin went from the wide receiver 20 to the wide receiver 10 over the last eight. Jerry Judy, I wanted to put him in here. Mm. Jerry Judy from the wide receiver 21 on the year, was the wide receiver 11 over the last eight games. Don't sleep on Jerry Judy. Dawson Knox completely forgotten over the first half of the year. Surprisingly, the tight end six over the last eight games so was still involved in the offense, even if he seemed like a complete waste all last year. So in general, you're saying Najee, Cam Akers, Keenan Allen, Chris Godwin, Jerry Judy, Dawson Knox, these guys are people to look at 
as probably being better than where their average draft position will be this coming season. It's very likely that that will happen. And maybe players like Najee, who are so young, you know, people might still be all about He's them. He's going to be fascinating. But Keenan Allen, he's an older player. Cam Akers, oh my gosh, what we've been through with Cam Akers. Jerry Judy, are we tired at this point? Chris Godwin, who's the quarterback? There are some players, though, that ended very strong. Godwin coming off the injury, pay attention. And then on the flip side, I'm going to give you five names that were kind of disasters over the last eight weeks, but their fantasy finishes looked great. Aaron Jones, Joe Mixon, Leonard Fournette, Christian Kirk, Gabe Davis. Aaron Jones was the running back 24 over the last eight. Joe Mixon, the RB 34. Fournette, the RB 35. Christian Kirk was the wide receiver 35 over the last eight. That one will be difficult to uh, determine what to do going into next year. And then Gabe Davis, the wide receiver oh, man. 49 over the last eight weeks. That's not good. And we just had, uh, I think it was Billy Bean, right, coming out and saying yep. he's fully confident in Gabe Davis. We'll see how that confidence carries into the free agency and NFL draft. But those are players that will probably be drafted maybe higher than they deserve because of the name value and the value they provided your team in the first half of the year, not the second half of the year. Number three. The late-round quarterback strategy is changing the landscape of getting the super sweet quarterback what? at the, I know at the end which it it's hard to even utter those words because back when our show started it was a difference a truly difference making strategy to let everyone else be a schmuck and draft use early draft capital on a on a quarterback knowing that you can just keep waiting Keep waiting because there's going to be quarterbacks at the end of the draft who are better than those early round guys. And just an early round quarterback was not actually safe, even though it it seemed like they should be. The data said that they they were not. Now last year, look, streaming the quarterback position it it can still work. I mean, you you still have the crazy number of you end up with the forty plus quarterbacks who hit at least one QB one week on the season, but it's getting harder. It's especially getting harder to find that streamer that's going to turn into a starting quarterback that you just set and forget. Last year, you had Justin Fields, and it took it took a, quite some time for the Chicago Bears to unlock him. And then the other one who you can even sort of talk about was Daniel Jones, and he wasn't a he was not a difference making uh, quarterback for your team. He just he was okay. Like I said, when we started, it was completely the opposite advice. Early round quarterbacks hurt you, but now the community of fantasy football players as a whole, we're smarter. We are getting absolutely better at this game. In the past three years, the difference making quarterbacks. So I mean by that I mean, you know, the guys who finish in the top four who truly have a points per game advantage over the rest of them and then and QB five through twelve. It's just a clump where QB is not that much worse than QB six, but the true difference makers in the past three years. They have all been drafted by round eight, where in the past you could get a running quarterback like Lamar Jackson in the double-digit rounds, a running quarterback like Josh Allen in the double-digit rounds back before the breakout. So this is something that we need to adjust. You need to be – You're not registering middleroundquarterback.com, are you? Ooh, that's, that's a nice – That's a pretty, uh, that's that's a pretty good idea. Yeah, so, uh, someone get on that. Someone get on that. <laughs> middle round quarterback. Get <laughs> but it, it, and for me, like – I've I've lived and died by that strategy for so long of like that uh, that's how I played fantasy football and even I'm looking at the data and I'm like I need to adjust I need to be willing to take that quarterback in the fifth round who I think is an, is a has the upside like you know I think like Kyler and or so was going in round five before he got hurt he was he was pretty good for fantasy football and these guys they've I, I, been identified by the community and especially. The guys that run. The cheat code is no longer a, a hidden fatality that you have to find your friend at the ball to tell it. Everybody just knows. Running quarterbacks produce. So this is more of a keeping your options open where you would have formerly had that door shut. Yes, absolutely. And if back in the day, round five, it was no way. I'm not taking a quarterback here because the, it, it won't make a difference to my team. But the top quarterbacks in the last three years by round eight, they're already gone. And, and Footland, we're going to need to adjust. We're going to need to be prepared. I'm, I'm watching these drafts that I'm in right I'm in two drafts right now. Both drafts, you have uh, Hertz, Josh Allen, Mahomes gone in round two. 
Wow. Round two. I pick wow. tw- I'm I'm on one one draft pick twenty. They're all three gone already. So the 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 consensus is going to change. Strategy is going to need to change, and we're going to need to adapt and make sure we know if that's the right place to pick them or not. Yeah, that it's a really difficult thing because you you think of those three names specifically, and you remember playing fantasy last year, and when you if you didn't have them, and you matched up against them, trouble. That feeling of trying to pick the right week and the right guy was it was a trepidatious thing. You had to overcome it with a lot from your other positions if you couldn't find that perfect week. So it is something that we'll continue examining. You know, uh, I didn't hear Mike say early round quarterback.com. So no. I think it's just a keeping uh, awareness. I, I think in home leagues, casual leagues, you're still going to see the benefits of later round quarterback uh, come to the forefront, stacking up your running backs, but not believing that the rest of the world is not in on the secret anymore. Right. Number two. I call this one lost players aren't found. Okay. These guys I'm very intrigued. We've 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 known this a little bit inherently for years, but we always can convince ourselves that the situation was the problem and it wasn't the player. Maybe this time. Maybe this time it'll work. I'm talking about players who lost a step. Players who just had a down year and I'm and it later in their career. If a player is later into a career and he has a down year. It ain't coming back. I'm just telling you right now, it's not coming back. It, it almost co- feels like you're saying the down year is something we need to say. He did lose a step. Yes, we need versus to. Versus just, oh, it's a down year. Exactly. We need to just say, yeah, he's lost it. That's fine. Maybe I'm wrong. But again, we're, it's about taking these bets. And the odds are that he's never going to come back to what he was in the past. And so I'm going to bet on a young guy breaking out over an old guy coming back. The comeback player of the year is almost always won by a guy coming back from an injury. Saquon Barkley was a young player who came back from... Not from coming <clears throat> back into youth. <laughs> right. He, getting younger. I he got the fountain, everybody. Yeah. He got injured as a young player and then had a down year as a young player and was back. That makes sense. But yeah, absolutely. Guys, guys yeah. like Allen Robinson, oh, Cortland man. Sutton, Darren Waller, they're all further along in their careers, and in 2021, they had a down year. But their situations all seem like they were vastly improved. Oh, my quarterback's better. My team is better. My situation is better. And so I'm I'm going to be back into these guys because they were studs. And and there we we give reasons why they were bad. It wasn't their fault. Uh, and and so we expect them to bounce back, but none of them did in that case, and they usually don't. They're worse than their previous years. And historically speaking. It's very rare for a player to have a bounce back player uh, bounce back year after losing a step. Um, so in 2022, you had Adam Thielen. Oh yeah, look, he's done. <sighs> oh man, they all of these players who lost something but are still playing. You're gonna have positive news about them. I promise you. I promise he's gonna look like his have youthful you, have self. Have you seen Allen Robinson in camp? Best shape of his life. <laughs> You see Allen Robinson no, in camp? He no, looks tell me mighty how, fine. Oh, I'm sure he's going to be great. Um, I did pay him so much money. You tricked me. <laughs> Adam Thielen is going to be tearing it up in camp, making these uh, you know defenders look silly. Um, the Aaron Rodgers one Aaron, is – Yeah, that's where I'm at. That's going to be – and for you to make that decision, I think it's going to be very impactful if the probabilities play out because that's just going to be too easy for players to – buy into the hopes and dreams of Aaron Rodgers. The real tough ones are going to be Aaron Rodgers, Russell Wilson, Cortland Sutton. Uh, the easy ones sure. will be the Jarvis Landry and the and the Adam Thielen. But when I look at this, I'm going to say that I'm going to bet against Aaron Rodgers, Russell Wilson, Cortland Sutton coming back just because their, their team changes or their head coach changes, and we want to excuse what we saw on the field from these players playing football. He, Aaron Rodgers had a chance. Okay, he lost Devontae Adams, and now he's going to get... No, he could have played better. He didn't. Russ could have played better. He didn't. I'm going to bet they that need they letter, don't come It's like back. they need letters from the parent to turn into the teacher as to why they got the bad grade. Right, yeah. Right? We're, we're all like trying to write the letter for him saying, no, 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 no. He'll, he'll be better on the next test. Yeah, but Aaron, they're rarely better on the next test. Aaron Rodgers' first ballot Hall of Famer. He's awesome. Russell Wilson, I think, should be in the Hall of Fame. I think he's been awesome in his career. I'm betting against these players 
Who sucked? We're supposed to get some uh, d- darkness retreat information here soon. Yeah, yeah. Very excited. Vision coming back, and um, we're supposed to get a decision. So, um, I I do see a couple names you threw in there that scare me. Uh, Deontay Johnson had a uh, a drop right in targets per route run. That was significant, which can be one of the signs of, of what you're talking about. Michael Gallup as well. Uh, is Deontay Johnson in that category for you? Well, Deontay Johnson's never been great. So, um, no. Wow. Uh, this guy. I, look, it's just on brand. I, Deontay Johnson's a very good wide receiver. This guy. Uh, Deontay Johnson. Why go Deontay Johnson when you can go Kyle Trask? That's what I've always said. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, no, Deontay Johnson, I don't think counts. Deontay Johnson is 26 years old. To me, uh, he's not at the end of his career where um, you're going to have okay. problems go, you know, rebounding. We decided, against our better judgment, of course, as is always the case, mm-hmm. uh, we leave our better judgment out of it, that Kyle was going to take the number one thing to remember this year. So uh, I'm going to tee you up. Number one. See, I teed you up. Well done. Um, I'm calling this one, get your tight ends checked out early. Whoa. Oh, man. Like, what hit the we doctor? Do? Yeah. <laughs> Let me ask you gentlemen a question. You guys are older. Okay. Talk All to right. Mike. You Talk know, there's there's some Mike things is for sure. <laughs> there's some things that you guys wanted to get checked out as you hit your 40s. There's some rule. Yeah, the doctor asked some different questions. My tight now. end. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, but the things you wish you would have known earlier on. And Mike brought this up, and he brings it up on the show that tight ends are the hardest to predict. It's really hard to figure out what are the sticky stats. Do they come out of nowhere, or do you find a season like Robert Tunyon where you get you know 10 touchdowns like just out of nowhere? So are there sticky stats for okay. tight ends that we can look at earlier on? Some signs and signals that uh, may clue us in on the next great tight end? Yeah, some tight end symptoms is what okay. we're looking at. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, so we actually, I don't know if you remember this, on the show a couple years ago, we pointed out a couple of tight ends that we thought could make the jump. George Kittle was one of those that mm. we talked about in 2018, and then he made the jump. Mark Andrews was another player, and... The key is finding the sticky stats that really matter for those tight ends, and can we use them moving forward? And there's two that I've found for tight ends. Okay, I'm ready. It's can they get yards after the catch, and what is their yards per route run? For tight ends, it's nice to see their snap counts, but they're also blocking a ton. So their routes are really what's more important, and we want tight ends that can get down the field and that can have big plays. We don't want Jack Doyle. Dude's out of the league, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah baby hands. We don't want Austin <laughs> Hooper that runs a five-yard drag and just falls over. Yeah. We're, we're looking for tight ends that can get down the field. So here's what I did. I looked at every tight end over the last decade and said, what do they do in their first two years? Are there any signs in their first two years that they could be great? I looked from Travis Kelsey. Now before, before you get into this, do we need to put this behind a paywall or anything? <laughs> we yeah, did we How valuable the is this information? Uh, you should be making dynasty trades because of this. Yeah. Okay, go on. I looked at Travis Kelsey. I looked at guys like Cl- Kobe Fleener. You know? oh, 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 love oh, Kobe oh, Fleener. Yeah, baby. <laughs> Kobe Fleener. I won't, I'm buying him a shirt right now. I won't I'm say buying. that both of those guys were my guys. But um, <laughs> I looked at names like Crockett Gilmore. Oh, Larry. Man. I mean, these are guys at the very beginning of the career that had a good career. And here's what I found. Tight ends that average over two yards per route run in their first two years. If one of those first two years they hit it, they end up being elite. Let me give you a list of these names. You tell me. How many yards per, per route run? Two. Okay. Two yards per route run. So I'll give you a list of players. Mark Andrews. Check. George Kittle. Check. Travis Kelsey. Check. O.J. Howard. Yeah, I mean, mm. the dude tore his Achilles, so. Uncheck. Yeah, but unchecked. Jordan Reed. It burned bright, but that was a big oh, check. Oh, rule 86 check. for life. Hunter Henry. Yeah, uh, he's been. Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, he's got yeah. like a little. He's Look, we circle were, in the check He was being drafted. Yeah. I mean, that's saying something for a tight end. Mark Andrews hit this list twice, and then Kyle Pitts was t- t- on TBD, the way. TBD. TBD. And then there's one more name we have to add to this list. He actually led all tight ends in yards per out run last year, and it's Chig Aconquo. Oh, yeah, buddy. Baby. Yeah, Chig. He's passing the vibe check. Chig had receptions down the field. He actually had three plays of over 40 yards, which is a big deal, and George Kittle did the same. So I think what we need to realize is for tight ends, we're looking at draft capital, but we're mostly asking ourselves, can they have really big plays, and over time, will that grow? So your advice here is basically try to get Chigaconquo and Kyle Pitts. Those are the two players 
that meet this criteria. I, They're future <laughs> superstars. You guarantee it. Kyle with the lock right here on the he show. He said before entering the studio, guys, I have the lock of the century. Right. I can't be wrong. Make sure the Foot Clan knows this and, and make sure it's <laughs> Kyle Borgagnoni. Uh, it's uh, yep, that, yep, yeah, Chico Conquo, uh huh, locked and loaded, Kyle Pitts, superstar, Kyle Pitts, definitely gonna be good. I mean, I, I, I like it. I, like I it. love the boldness, Kyle. I love the confidence in that declaring your guarantees. Yeah, that's why we gave him the number one spot. We wouldn't have given him the number one spot if it wasn't a lock, right? If it wasn't right. a guarantee, we don't no. want inf like we give information, you use it how you will. Kyle gives locks, yeah. guarantees. Yeah. <laughs> Things that you can look back on in the future mm -hmm. and see how right he was. Set your clock by it. Yeah. He's probably Set been, your he's, clock he, by I, the lock? Problem yeah. is, is I, I believe in those two players. You know I do. Well, honestly, if I thought he was giving bad advice, I wouldn't joke about this because people oh, right. would actually go, yeah. no, I think this is good advice. Yeah. I, and I, he I, thinks it's a guarantee. <laughs> and there, are, there are players that when you watch them, I mean, I think we've all watched Kyle Pitts, and while we are frustrated with the results, we see – the, the the skill set and we see the ability and we know the age so we say at some point barring injury you should see that come to fruition I think Chig was the real surprise but the athleticism was on display immediately and ironically it was on display directly next to Austin Hooper so there there were like the contrast in physical athletic ability becoming a go to target the absence on the team I think it's um I think it's a good Good tip. Do you like uh, Dalton Kincaid coming in? I do. I do too. Yeah, I think who is older, Dalton Kincaid or Kyle Pitts? Oh, it'll be Kyle Pitts is still doesn't have a driver's license. <laughs> yeah, it, so that's true. He's, that's true. Dalton He's, Kincaid's older than Kyle Pitts. Yeah, so if Kyle Pitts was coming in as a rookie this year, he'd be younger than Dalton Kincaid. Wow. Do you like Michael, if, you Michael know John Mayer? If next year, if next year Dalton Kincaid and Kyle Pitts came in, Kyle Pitts would be the younger rookie. Same five years from now. <laughs> impressive um i think we did it i think we're i think we that's wrapped it up. 10 things brooks is nodding at me like we completed a good show episode we did you did. enjoy yourself brooks it's a great show oh man what did it really add to the episode the way that the the jason brought in the number nine that was good but i don't think we get enough cup talk though no, Jason's cup. Hey, you been drinking? I have to pee so bad. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I've been sweating over here. On that note, we're done. But we'll be back with another episode next, <laughs> next week, Tuesday. Free agent landing spots. Talk to you then. Goodbye. Kobe Fleener! <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for listening to another episode of the Fantasy Footballers Podcast. Join our fantasy football community on jointhefoot.com. And follow us on Twitter at the FF Ballers.